Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is Jim Quinn. He is the creator of the Burning Platform website, which is very, very popular for you out there who have not heard of it and should go look at it immediately. So thank you for joining us here today, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me. Great. Now, Jim, what inspired you to name the website The Burning Platform? Because you talk about a lot of important topics on there, like investing, finance, Austrian school economics, politics. And what inspired you to call the website The Burning Platform? Um, well, it, it actually is from a quote from David Walker, who uh, used to be the, uh, uh, the head of the GAO uh, and has since left. And uh, I, I, he's now the president of, uh, of uh, the Pete Peterson Foundation. So he he um, he actually produced a movie called I O U S A, uh, you know, talking about our debt crisis and uh, our uh, unsustainable fiscal path. So one of his quotes back when he was uh, the head of the GAO was that the, the United States was uh, on a, blur, a burning platform of of unsustainable fiscal policies, uh, health health care debt, uh, war. Um, so I thought that, that fit perfectly with what I was trying to get across uh, to the public. So I, I, I named it the Burning Platform uh, after that quote. Very good, yeah. And I saw IOUSA. That was one of the first documentaries I actually saw when I first started to wake up uh, right after the 2008 market crash. And my parents, you know, uh, like half their stock portfolio was literally evaporated. Um, the mainstream media didn't have a good explanation for what was really happening, and I was online and looking for the truth about what was really happening, if someone had a rational explanation for why things were happening the way they were. Yeah, I mean, that, that movie hit exactly at the, at the crisis point, uh, and it had been made prior. So the things that they were warning about, you know, immediately came to uh, fruition. Um, the movie did get out into the theaters, but it didn't get much. I think it got on CNN a little bit. Um, I was able to get it, um, get my university to play for our MBA students, um, and then they, uh, then the, David Walker and a few others did a uh, sort of a nationwide tour, and they came to my university and uh, I, I saw them there. So, I mean, he's been on the front lines of it. Uh, I, I, basically, I considered him and Ron Paul to be the, you know, the leaders of of warning the country on on the 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 dangerous nature of our debt and, and our, uh, the system that we've got in place right now. Exactly. And I, I think Ron Paul has been the clear frontline leader. And before most people go out there and look and study Austrian school economics or go to the Mises website, they get their start in everything by Ron Paul because Ron Paul is so prominent on the mainstream media. He's on CNBC. He's on Bloomberg. He, will, he was on a lot of the mainstream political uh, shows and channels. And the stuff he was saying, and if you talk to a regular mainstream person, someone who hasn't woken up like you and me, and they listen to Ron Paul for five or ten minutes, they'll say afterwards, a lot of them will say, that the stuff he says makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot more sense than the stuff that the other two politicians are saying. And plus, this guy sounds honest and genuine. Yeah, uh, my, I mean, he is the reason I have a website. He is the reason I write articles. Uh, I had never written an article in my entire life until 2008. Um, you know, I had just been, you know, a, a just, you know, regular guy working job for the last 20 some years, and uh, I saw the way that the Republican Party was treating him during the 2008 uh, primaries, and I thought it was disgusting. You know, uh, th this was a guy who clearly knew more than the other candidates who were running regarding all these fiscal issues, and, and he saw the big picture. So I, I saw that he was getting, you know, short... But that's dangerous. Yeah, short you know the bit. And that, so I wrote an article. My first article I ever wrote was called uh, Why We Need Ron Paul. And, and Lou Rockwell uh, was kind enough to post it on his website, and that was the beginning of me writing. And basically that was, I think it was maybe April of 2008, and I've been writing, you know, an article every week or two for the last, you know, four years since then. Great. And Ron Paul, you know, like you said, he, he does know the truth and he does 
do a good job of explaining the platform and why things are happening the way they are. But the, the reason neither party likes him is because he threatens the status quo and both parties make so much money off the status quo and they don't really want to change the status quo in any kind of material way. No, the, the, basically, you watch these two candidates, the debate the other night on foreign policy, there wasn't 1% difference between those two guys. They're both... They're both warmongers, and they're both going to spend us into oblivion. They're, they're, they, want, they both want to police the world even and spend a trillion dollars a year on, on defense when we don't have a trillion dollars to spend. I don't even call it defense. I call it a war because we're, we're not – It's offense. We're, yeah, we're not defending anything. There's, there's nobody in the world that threatens us in reality with, with our forces, but still we have to spend a trillion dollars per year – you know, basically the military industrial – everything that Eisenhower warned about in his speech it has come true. Uh, the military industrial complex has control over a vast part of the government, and Ron Paul is the only one who's been uh, willing to call that out on the Democrat side or the Republican side. Um, I think, I think uh, Romney and the Republicans could pay a, a big price for the way they treated Ron Paul – uh, by stealing his delegates, uh, by changing rules during the primary process, uh, by not letting him speak at the convention, by not taking any of his uh, of his ideas into the platform. I mean, this election looks like it's going to come down to like it could be like a one or two percent difference between these two candidates. And I know, I know, being a Ron Paul uh, voter and someone who believes in his message. I'm not going to vote for either one of those candidates. I'm I'm going to vote Libertarian because you know Gary Johnson's as close as you're going to, you're going to get to the uh, to the to Ron Paul as far as the issues go. So if if Romney loses by a fraction of a percent, it's going to it could be because of the way he treated Ron Paul and all the uh, potential Republican voters who will not vote for Romney because of the way they they treated Ron Paul's Ron Paul and his issues. Yeah, I, I'm planning on either voting for Gary Johnson if, if he's on the ballot in my state or writing in for Ron Paul. And while I don't think either, obviously, is, is going to do anything significant in this election, I'm optimistic that four years from now in the next election that as the libertarians proven uh, and the Austrian school economists who continue to make good predictions that more people will wake up and that in four years from now that the Libertarian Party and maybe Ron Paul runs as a vice president on the in four years from now or something, and the Libertarian Party could actually make a significant uh, run at the next election of maybe over 10 percent of the vote. Yeah, I was I was actually hoping uh, I was hoping that that after the Republicans you know sort of cast aside Ron Paul that he might you know switch over. I mean he ran. As a libertarian for president in 1980, so I mean he he's been in the libertarian party before. So I thought that maybe if he had run this time as the libertarian candidate, I'm pretty darn sure that he would get would have gotten close to you know seven to ten percent of the national vote if he had done that. Because it, what you saw in the primaries is that he is drawing young people. It's the young people that realize that the, the older generations have screwed them, basically, and they see Ron Paul's message. They realize that they're, they're being handed a $100 trillion unfunded liability. Uh, you know, they're 20 years old, and th they have a $100 trillion bill to pay uh, that was created by their parents and grandparents, and, you know, they have no interest in policing the world, you know, that – you know they're just trying to get a start in life, and they're stuck here with a you know no chance for jobs. Uh, they're, they're you know weighed down by what a trillion dollars in student loan debt, uh, which is uh, you know another scam that's going on. Which is um, Obama and his administration are basically uh, using student loans, uh, federal student loans, as a way to keep the unemployment rate down by by dishing out these loans to anybody who. Who you know can breathe to go to college, even though they shouldn't be in college, and the sole reason is to keep the unemployment rate down around eight percent. Because if you're enrolled in college, you're not counted as unemployed. So you know, so he burdens these kids with debt. 
you know, and they come out with no chance for a job to begin with because they probably shouldn't have been in college in the first place. Exactly, and it's created a big bubble, and it's co- it's allowed the colleges because the government's backing the credit to keep raising the tuition Absolutely. prices, and then the kids, yeah, and, and then the kids graduate with no real skills, uh, except for the exception of a few majors, mostly math and science majors, who are still uh, having some luck now getting jobs. But pretty much almost everyone else outside of those majors is resorted to looking for part-time jobs. Um, I, I know in the D.C. area, which is where I live right now. Um, the D.C. area supposedly has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the entire country and is supposedly doing the best because it's so, quote-unquote, insulated by the government. But there's a ton, I, I can tell you from personal experience, there's a ton of people who graduate with college degrees, who I'm friends with, who are working two or three part-time jobs in the private sector, and this is if they want to work in the private sector. Like, they could go work for the government or go be a teacher and go get paid, like, a higher paycheck and guarantee government benefits and stuff like that. But um, if they want to work in the private sector, the average salary often is two to three times lower, no benefits. You can get fired immediate, almost immediately after you get hired. And I know a lot of people just to pay food and rent who are living paycheck to paycheck, working two to three part-time jobs with almost no sleep. Yeah, I mean, that was, the, that, that was a, a big point in my last, my last article is that, you know, student loan debt in the year 2000 was $200 billion. Uh, even before the crisis in 2007, it was 600 billion, and in the last four years, it's gone to over a trillion dollars. And and it used to be a private market, uh, but now it's completely 100% federal market. And you know, it's the same. It, it's the same scam. It's it's sort of it's like subprime mortgages again, except that these are subprime education. Uh, the, you know, the, I've, uh, in the article, I noted that. Of the people who are not in the grace period on these loans, 18% are already delinquent. So this is it's all going to be a lot higher. Yeah, this is all going to fall on the taxpayer again. This is there's going to be a giant student loan debt bailout, and it's all going to fall on us again. But they don't care because they're just going to print. They're they're trying to you know give the appearance that unemployment is improving. And they're trying to give the appearance that the economy is improving by dishing out subprime auto loan debts. Uh, uh, what people don't realize is that, you know, Ally Financial, which is, you know, GMAC basically, is, is handles all, almost all of the loans for GM and for Chrysler. They're 85% owned by the federal government. So, again, they're giving out these six-year 0% loans from from Ally Financial, which is a governmental entity, so that it looks like car sales are booming when they're not really booming. They're just giving these cars away to people who really can't afford them. So it's you know it, it's it's, pon- it's, it's Ponzi finance. It is. It's it's it's, 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 it's rent seeking. It's it's doctoring up the numbers in the short term to make the appearance that like people will completely forget about the long term. And you have the government doing the same thing in the home builders because, you know, a lot of that shadow inventory, a lot of money has been printed up by the Fed and by other foreign central banks who are in dollar pegs. And they've been coming in and buying up a lot of shadow inventory, sometimes 40, 50 homes a uh, pop and taking them off and renting these out. And then you have the home builders who uh, – the home builders here in the United States who are publicly traded are government-sponsored enterprises. Most people don't realize this, but they get government tax credits, massive ones, and then if they lose money, the Congress covers all their losses each quarter. So they're starting to build again now too. This is just ridiculous, all the bubbles that are being reinflated and the new bubbles, which is what our economy has essentially turned into, is you know when one bubble pops, they either try to reinflate that bubble or they try to find a new one to inflate. Exactly. That's – you're exactly right with the housing market. The the, the mainstream media is, keeps touting all the rising home prices. The, the what they're doing is, like you said, they're uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are selling off you know huge chunks of of their foreclosed homes to crony capitalists who have connections in Washington. So it's again, it's it's the Wall Street crowd. Is able to buy, you know, you and I don't have a chance to buy up, you know, houses at a cheap, cheap rate because we can't borrow at zero. These guys, right. these guys have, these guys can borrow at zero, and then you have the the Chinese, and you have all the Saudis, and all these other guys coming in and doing the same thing and with their Wall Street contacts. Right, and then what they're doing is, and then the Wall Street banks are holding off the. They've got tons of foreclosures. I mean, people are living in their houses for three years without paying uh, a mortgage. 
because the banks do not want to foreclose on it because once they foreclose, then they have to actually write it off on their books. So their books are a scam. Uh, I, I had a little post today about how their, the, the delinquency rate among uh, for, for loans of the Wall Street banks is still at like near record highs, but the actual charge-off rate is way below that. They're only charging off like 1% or 2% when their delinquency rate is up around 6 or 7%. So for, for decades, those two numbers were always close. So what they're doing is they're just not writing things off. And they, every quarter, all the, the uh, profits that the Wall Street banks have been reporting are essentially false. They, they've been relieving their uh, loan loss reserves, basically an accounting entry, and, and trying to say that that was the real profits that they made. It's it's just it's just it's fraudulent accounting, and then what they're what they're creating again is is sort of a a, a fake boom. Uh, uh, like in Phoenix, home prices have gone up I think twenty thirty percent in the last year, and that's because there isn't enough inventory on the market, and you've got the flippers coming in, and you've got the speculators, and you've got the these people, like you said, who bought up the properties and then turning them into rental units. And the truth is, it's the again, the young people are getting screwed here because they don't get a chance to get an ent- a great entry-level price on a house. If you're driving prices up on ha- housing, you know, artificially, then, you know, you're helping maybe somebody who's already underwater, uh, but you're certainly not helping the, you know, the kid out of college, 25 to 30 years old, is looking to buy their first house. I mean, that, that's how that, that's a healthy economy. You've got kids coming out of college. They get a good job, then they buy a house, and then it's you know that that's a positive you know economic situation. That isn't happening at all. I mean, uh, you know, like you said, yeah. you've got kids I, with I, part-time college degrees and part-time jobs at Ruby Tuesdays, and you know, burdened with debt and no chance to buy a house. So. Yeah, you, I'm an Austrian school economist, and the mainstream is obviously Keynesian or Neo-Keynesian or some mixture of these two, and they would disagree with me on this, but a healthy economy to me is one where the price levels due to competition and free market forces, you're getting a higher quality good and service at a low price due to free market forces and competition, so I want those lower prices. I want more purchasing power for my money. Um, I wouldn't mind if the wages dropped because then maybe there would be more entrepreneurs and small businesses who would be looking to hire. But, you know, you have the Keynesians blocking this. You have Congress blocking this because they don't want the tax revenues to drop. And that's why they're putting all these rules, regulations, red tape, taxes, and the Fed is trying to prop everything up, including wages and taxes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you you read John Hussman, but, he, you know, from the very beginning of this crisis, he's he's laid out what needed to happen for – of course, you know, like you said, if you being an Austrian, if you have a boom, you're going to have to have a bust. You have the bust. You you clear out the 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 the, um, the failure, and you clear out the bad debt, and you start over again. Um, but they haven't they haven't allowed that to happen. That they, they because the politicians yeah. because the politicians who are in power would all be voted out of office, and you know our, our economy has just become so controlled by politicians and the economic and political elites that they won't do what's right for the whole country in the long term. Right, they li- they lie to the American public. The, the 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 Wall Street banks could have been liquidated in an orderly fashion during the, using our bankruptcy laws that already exist. They they could have the depositors would not have lost a dime because that's because the FDIC guarantees the deposits. The what the people who would have been wiped out are the executives of the of the Wall Street banks, the bondholders of the Wall Street banks, and the stockholders of the Wall Street banks, which are all the elite, the rich elite, you know, powerful people that run this country. They would have they would have taken the lumps. Uh, these banks would have the good assets of these banks would have been sold off to the to other banks because there's eight over eight thousand banks in this country, but you know, ten of them you know, control like 70% of the market. So, you know, those 10 were the ones that are, are were insolvent and are still insolvent today. So 
the fact that we let the, these zombie banks exist. I mean, you look at Citicorp. I mean, you know, the, the CEO just quits right out of the blue. You know, you, you know there's something desperately wrong at that bank. Um, you know, Bank of America, we, the government just sued them for a billion dollars yesterday, I think it was. I mean, they're, they're, the people running these places are criminals. Exactly. And now turning to our t uh, our attention here to another topic, and this is an interrelated one, let's talk about the U.S. dollar. So you talked about the banking system. We've talked about the bubbles. Um, is this going to put the most pressure here on the U.S. dollar, and do you think the dollar is going to hyperinflate, or do you think the central planners and the Federal Reserve will be able to keep things in a controlled stagflation using financial repression, wealth effect, maybe going after people's 401ks and IRAs uh, for the next few years? They'll be able to prolong this thing out longer than people think. Um, I mean, the U.S. dollar, the only reason the U.S. dollar appears strong against the, you know, the basket of other currencies is because – Europe just happens to be worse than us. Uh, you know, they're they're just farther along in their in their collapse than we are. So, you know, the fact that the dollar isn't even stronger against the euro, you know, it says a lot. Um, I mean, what the what the what Bernanke and and the government are trying to do is obscure. You know, you're right. They're trying to like extend this, extend and pretend as long as they possibly can, but. It's, it, yeah, and it'll work for a while. I mean, QE this and QE that. I mean, it, it and stops. most people are too busy. Also, to they're too busy working their asses off just to pay their bill and make it day to day. Yeah, I mean, I try to I try to put it in you know terms that the average person can handle, uh, that, that understand. I mean, just look what he's done with the zero interest rate policy. You know, who who in the real world has this benefited? I, I use my mother as, as an example, so, or any retired person who lives off of their Social Security and maybe a, a small IRA that they accumulated over 50 years, right? So mm -hmm. you've got you've got millions of these, you know, widows and and little old ladies who, in 2007, so maybe they're bringing in, maybe they're getting, you know. Fourteen thousand dollars a year in social security payments, and then so so th that's their entire income, and then maybe they accumulated say let's say a hundred thousand dollars over their entire life, and they have and they're risk averse, so they have it in a, say a, a money market fund in two thousand seven. Money markets were paying about five percent in two thousand seven, so they that would give a senior citizen an extra five thousand dollars on top of say the fourteen. So that they could get by, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're certainly not living high on nineteen thousand bucks a year, uh, but maybe your house is paid off and that sort of thing, and your your expenses aren't that high. Today, that same senior citizen, you know, f uh, what f uh, f four or five years later, the social security payments have gone up maybe, you know, uh, maybe a hundred bucks, you know, in five years, uh, and and now they're getting. 0.15% on their money market fund. So somebody who was getting $5,000 a year, uh, you know, in 2007 before this crisis is getting like 150 bucks in interest. That's a big cut in your, you know, the, the way that you have to live. Um, and in the meantime, you know, the inflation, real inflation, not the inflation that the BLS puts out, has been running at least at 5% per year. Not at the two percent that they report. I mean, I'm sure you've you know you've uh, seen John Williams and Shadow Stats, and you know he's got the charts of what 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 the real inflation number is and what the real unemployment rate is. And yeah, and the the Austrian True Money Supply is actually saying the inflation rate's double what John Williams is saying, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, my wife today said she just came from the grocery store. She, she said, "Do you know what?" Ba how much bacon went up in the last week? I mean, you know, my kids like bacon. But, I mean, the, the price of bacon went up like 15% in a week. Uh, you know, the, so food and energy have been skyrocketing. I, I made a post last week saying, you know, showing how the BLS, you know, they weight these various things like food. Food and food and energy have a very low weighting in their uh, in their calculation for CPI. The, the thing that has the huge weighting is a, is their fake owner's equivalent rent 
number, which is like 43% of the CPI figure. And who knows how they even calculate that? That's some sort of, you know, mod, they have yeah, some there's... sort of model that does it. No one understands. Of course, no one understands because they don't want you to understand. <laughs> Yeah, and there, there's a lot of games played with all the BLS's formulas, uh, especially because, you know, they, they don't want to pay higher payments for the cost of living adjustments, for Social Security, for government employee pension plans, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's clear that they have these goofy things where if the price of a steak goes up by 10%, they assume that you switch away from steak and go to hamburger. So, so the price of steak didn't really go up 10%. Uh, you know, and I guess when the price of hamburger goes up 10% and you you switch to cat food, you know, then the price of hamburger didn't go up 10%. It, it's ridiculous, the kinds of things. And it's all happened since 1983. Greenspan, and, and it, it was actually led by Alan Greenspan. So they basically have created a, a fake inflation number. If you If you go back to the exact way they calculated it prior to 1983, that inflation is running somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, if you calculate unemployment rate the way they did during the Depression, when they said that the unemployment rate in the Depression was 25%, if you calculate it the exact same way today, then it's running at 22%. So, and they're reporting, what, 7.8%. It, you know, it, it, the, it's all a big scam to keep people convinced that things aren't terrible when they really are. Yeah, I, I agree, and that's to keep the people that are doing all this bad things, that cause the bad things in the first place, in power. Um, I, I have one final question here before we wrap up the interview. Um, since we have the presidential elections coming up, uh, what do you expect after those elections? What do you think the next four years are going to look like for the United States? Um, I I have a feeling that, that Romney might pull this out. It seems like the momentum is swinging in his direction, plus – I've put up some charts that show that Wall Street is contributed to his campaign at a four to one rate over over Obama. So that tells me that the people who who run this country favor him. So I wouldn't put anything past them pulling this off for for Romney. But whoever wins, neither one of them has any plans whatsoever to cut back on government. Even, no matter what they say in these debates, whatever they say on TV, it's all false. Under either one of these presidents, by, two, by the end of their term, the national debt will be at $20 trillion. It doesn't matter which of these two candidates. There's so much stuff that is on automatic pilot, and neither one of them is, will cut military. And, and even when they talk about cuts, they're not really cuts. They slow down the growth of spending. So, it, it, they again, exactly. it's, more, it's more lies. It's it, no one, no one had a plan other than Ron Paul, and actually, I think, and his son Rand to actually cut, cut the debt. I mean, the, we're talking when they talk about cuts, they're saying, oh, we won't run trillion, one point three trillion dollar deficits annually. We're going to run. You know, uh, nine hundred or a trillion, nine hundred billion or a trillion per year in deficits. So that's that's what they consider a cut. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, if interest rates just equal equalize back to a normal rate of four or five percent, when the debt's at twenty trillion, that's a trillion dollars in interest expense alone, and we only bring in two point two trillion in tax revenue. So the the whole thing. Dep again, it depends upon interest rates staying at 2% or 3% forever, and they won't. Uh, eventually, you know, you, you can see the foreign countries, China, moving away from the dollar, and eventually, it, you know, it's all going to give way. I don't know when. I don't know whether they, could, they can hold on for four years, uh, six years, or ten years, but I do believe we're in the midst of a crisis that will – somehow resolve itself within the next 15 years and there's going to be a lot of pain uh, and a lot of anguish and probably some you know war between now and then yeah i would agree with a lot of what you just said and i i think the end result here is that unless americans have money coming in and they're investing it appropriately to protect themselves and their purchasing power it's going to result in a massive 
decrease in the standard in their standard of living. Yeah, I mean, people always, uh, you know, there's always, you know, pluses. People, you know, either are big on gold or they scorn it and ridicule it. The way I looked at it is, I go back to the Germany, you know, in the space of what two years, their currency became worthless. If you had had, you know, say, if you had gold instead of uh, Deutschmarks in, you know, 1921, you would still have that gold after the their currency had gone to zero. Then they reissue a new currency. You'd have the gold to buy the new currency or whatever thing came out. So you would not be wiped out. That's the way I look at gold and silver and and why every person should have some some of that uh, owned physically uh, because at some point I think they're going to try to push a reset button, you know, and say, okay, the, you know, the U.S. dollar is dead, but we're going to issue this, you know, this new thing, whatever it is, whether it's a, uh, a worldwide currency or whatever. But the, the people running this country are – know it's unsustainable and are going to are going to pull the plug on it at some point. That's why you want, that's why I think you have to have gold and silver so that you'll be able to convert that into whatever uh you know is new, whatever becomes the new currency in the future. Yeah, I completely agree and I think physical bullion is an important insurance tool for wealth preservation and it's outside the system just in case the stock market does crash. Uh, the bond market does crash or whatever else may happen uh, in terms of, like, market intervention or um, loss of our civil liberties. Yeah. I mean, uh, it'll be interesting to see if this German thing where the – I guess the German court said said Germany has to prove that the actual physical gold exists. Uh, that could be an interesting process to see if it really does exist. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tune to Ron Paul getting another audit of the Fed then. Yeah, yeah. I mean – I'm glad his son is in the Senate. Uh, it's, you know, I think he'll somewhat carry the torch. He's he's had to bow down, I guess, to the Republican establishment a little bit, but he's still a thorn in their side. I loved watching some of his. He really makes everybody uncomfortable. Okay, great. And in conclusion, here, Jim, as we wrap up the interview, can you please tell our listeners uh, more about your website and uh, any anything else uh, you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's the uh, it's www the uh, the burning platform dot com it's a I consider it a sort of a wild west you can say anything it's a it's not for the squeamish uh, people get into big uh, you know arguments and there's lots of commenters and a lot of intelligence on the site um, and you know I'd say it has a it definitely has a libertarian Ron Paul bent to it but anybody is free to post and uh, you know can defend their position so uh, I, I you know invite anybody to show up uh, and uh, and I'll be definitely posting more of of inter the great interviews that you guys do on my site and uh, I think we'll be you know I think we're in you know I think both of our sites are pretty much alike and uh, you know we need to support each other Great, and that's definitely something I like to hear, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I interviewed you. I had a, a lot of fun interviewing you and speaking to you about uh, your views on things, and uh, hopefully we can have you back on very soon. Great. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it.